We'll now welcome our second panel, and I'm uh, pleased to introduce the Honorable Patrick McFarlane, who is the Inspector General for the Office of Personal Management, and he's accompanied by Mr. Jeffrey Cole, OPM's Deputy Inspector General for Audits. We also have Mr. Tamburino, who is the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Civilian Personnel Policy. We have Ms. Valerie Melvin, Director of Information Management and Human, Human Capital Issues for the Government Accountability Office. We have Mr. Patrick Manzo, who is the Executive Vice President for Global Customer Service and Chief Privacy Officer for Monster Worldwide. And we have Mr. Conway, who is the Senior Vice President and Chief Information Officer for Monster Worldwide. Uh, again, um, panelists, pursuant to our committee rules, I will ask that you all stand and raise your right hand to be sworn in. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Let the record reflect that um, all of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Uh, I understand we have four statements, and so what I will do is um, ask you to limit your opening statement to five minutes. Of course, your written statement has been entered into the record today. And with that, uh, uh, Mr. McFarland, I will recognize you for five minutes for an opening. If I can get you to yeah, push you and go ahead and bring the microphone down there, too. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Ross, Ranking Member Lynch, and members of this subcommittee. My name is Patrick McFarlane, and I am the Inspector General of the U.S. Office of Personnel Management. Thank you for inviting me. I will be discussing how OPM implements and utilizes IT policies and systems on an agency wide basis. The first issue that must be examined is how OPM develops its IT systems. Building an IT system must be done in a very deliberate, structured, and methodical manner that takes budgeting, development, and subsequent maintenance, testing, risk analysis, and security protections of the IT system into account. Such processes are important because it is easier and much more efficient to invest the time and resources necessary to develop the right procedures to use going forward than it is to go back and fix problems after they occur. In our estimation, OPM has encountered difficulty in this area because it sometimes lacks the needed dedicated expertise to properly oversee the development of agency IT systems projects. I know that the subcommittee is particularly interested in the recent in-house implementation of USA Jobs 3.0. We, too, have concerns, but we have not yet had an opportunity to review OPM's implementation process. Therefore, during the fiscal year, we intend to conduct two audits of the USA Jobs system. The first audit, for which we are already planning, will evaluate whether appropriate IT security controls exist to minimize the risk of security breaches. Second audit will review whether OPM followed systems development lifecycle procedures properly. Another area of concern for us is OPM's IT security governance. While improvements have been made over the last year, OPM's IT security program still operates in a highly decentralized manner that has proven to be ineffective. The CIO and OPM's program offices share responsib responsibility for IT security. In practice, this has meant that the program offices manage most aspects of IT security and the CIO provides mainly policy development and oversight. This is problematic because OPM program offices tend to focus their resources and efforts on operational issues and make IT security a secondary concern. Consequently, we continue to recommend that the CIO be given the resources necessary to centralize the responsibility for the security of OPM IT systems. I would like to remind the subcommittee that IT matters are neither the source of nor the solution to all of OPM's problems related to its core functions. I am particularly troubled by OPM's continuing pattern of making improper payments to deceased annuitants. Instead of spending resources on recovering those improperly paid funds, OPM should instead be focusing 
on preventing these payments from being made in the first place. My office issued reports in 2005, 2006, 2008, and 2011 to the OPM directors that expressed concern and made recommendations about how to prevent improper payments. Our 2011 report noted that improper payments to deceased annuitants averaged $120 million annually over the last five years. While only a portion of this amount represents long-term improper payments, these payments are the most problematic because our experience is that these improper payments usually cannot be recovered. As an example, our report noted the case of an annuitant's son who continued to receive benefits until 2008, 37 years after his father's death in 1971. The improper payment in this case exceeded $515,000 and was reported to OPM only when the son died. None of these funds could be recovered. We have work, worked closely with the agency in working groups comprised of OIG staff and OPM program officials. This has resulted in a number of recommendations, many of which OPM has implemented. However, such actions have proven to be only partial remedies to a systemic problem. OPM must continue to adapt to an increasingly automated world. We have been working with Director Berry to prevent these improper payments and will, and will continue to do so in the future. We particularly appreciate his proactive support. Thank you again for inviting me here today and would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, General McFarland. Uh, Mr. Tamburino, you are recognized for five minutes for opening. Chairman Moras, Ranking Member Lynch, and members of the subcommittee, on behalf of the Secretary of Defense, Liani Panetta, thank you Mr. for Mr. Tamburino, excuse me, could you pull that just a little bit closer? Sure. The, yes, sir. The sound system is picking it up. Thank Good. you. Um, on behalf of the Secretary of Defense, Liani Panetta, thank you for inviting the Department of Defense to appear at this hearing to discuss the U.S. Office of Personnel Management's efforts to modernize the Federal Government's hiring and retirement's claim system. My testimony today includes background regarding DOD's participation in the USA Jobs 3.0 project and the context for DOD's decision to support that effort. I am also pleased to testify regarding DOD's retirement practice. DOD is one of the world's largest civilian employers with close to one million civil servants proudly supporting our warfighters. The high volume of hiring actions that passes through DOD each year underscores the importance of USA Jobs and its ability to improve hiring timelines. We process approximately 245,000 civilian hiring actions in fiscal 2010 and 200,000 actions in fiscal 2011. These numbers include transfers, promotions, reassignments, and other actions. DOD has made great strides in reforming the hiring process by reducing hiring timelines, streamlining the hiring process, and focusing on efficient hiring practices. We have embraced the President's hiring reform initiatives and successfully implemented measures to improve both the applicant and hiring manager experience, attracting and obtaining top talent, and improving the hiring timelines. In FY 2009, DOD's average time to complete a competitive hire the focus of the President's mandate was estimated at 155 days. In fiscal 2011, the reported average timeline was 107 days, a 31 percent reduction from 2009. We have improved our hiring timelines in all categories. All the trend lines are moving in the right direction, with the timeline for all types of hires now standing at 72 days. A key component of DOD's hiring reform efforts is, is a focus on improving the enterprise automation that supports our hiring and staffing processes. As OPM's hiring reform initiatives began, the Chief Human Capital Officers Council commissioned a study to improve the entire Federal hiring infrastructure, including USA Jobs. DOD participated in that study and has been a full partner with OPM throughout the USA Jobs 3.0 design and development process. The issues experienced with the deployment of USA Jobs are not unlike the complexity of the issues I have, I have experienced as a major defense acquisition program executive. While we experienced significant challenges at the start, DOD, in partnership with OPM, confronted these challenges quickly and effectively. Our hiring efforts have not been hampered by the deployment of USA Jobs 3.0. Our decision was and continues to be to stay the course with OPM as our goal of consistently posting announcements with confidence to reach high-quality job seekers is being realized. 
Turning to the issue of retirement processing, in the mid-1990s, DOD began to consolidate benefits processing in all of our components by maximizing the use of automation and technology. We currently have three regional benefit centers which perform processing for most of the DOD workforce and collectively process approximately 24,000 retirements a year. These centers are very successful due to the hard work of the regional benefits advisors and the frontline human resource specialists providing service to our customers. Over the past several years, DOD has consistently exceeded OPM's aging of separation performance requirement with the timely processing of retirement claims. While we acknowledge that some employees have experienced delays in having their claims adjudicated, OPM is partnering with DOD and other Federal agencies to transform business processes for accurate and expeditious processing of retirement claims. DOD is committed to sustaining our efforts to attracting the highest, quality, highest caliber applicants, providing hiring managers a superior set of tools to meet their hiring needs, and sustaining a flexible set of information technology tools that can be modernized as needed. We look forward to sustaining our partnership with OPM in this regard. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak with you on these important topics. I am pleased to take your questions. Thank you, Mr. Tamburino. Ms. Melvin, you are recognized for five minutes for an opening. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Lynch, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting me to testify at today's hearing on OPM's modernization of its hiring and retirement systems, which, as you have noted, are essential to ensuring an effective Federal workforce. I will start by saying that we have not examined the USA Jobs Initiative that is being discussed today. However, we have previously issued several reports on OPM's initiatives to modernize its retirement processing capabilities, and at your request, I will briefly summarize our findings from those reports. Over approximately two decades, beginning in 1987, OPM attempted to modernize its Federal employee retirement process by automating paper-based processes and replacing its antiquated information systems. However, its efforts were largely unsuccessful, as, be, as has been noted. Our studies found that the agency was hindered by weaknesses in a number of important management disciplines that are essential to successful IT modernizations. These included project management, risk management, and organizational change management. For example, in reporting on the agency's efforts in 2005, we noted that while it had defined major retirement modernization system components, OPM had not identified the deficiencies among them, thus increasing the risk that delays in one project activity could hinder progress in others. OPM also did not have a process for identifying and tracking project risk and mitigation strategies on a regular basis. And it did not have a plan that would help users transition to different job responsibilities after deployment of a new system. These deficiencies existed over many years in which OPM planned, analyzed, and redirected the program, but without, without delivering the modernized capabilities. In 2008, as the agency was on the verge of deploying a system, we raised other management concerns and offered recommendations for improvement. Specifically, test results one month prior to deploying a major system component showed that it had not performed as intended. Also, defects and a compressed testing schedule increased the risk that the deployed system would not work as planned. Further, the cost estimate that OPM had developed was not supported by documentation needed to establish its reliability. And finally, the baseline against which OPM was measuring program progress did not reflect the full scope of the project, meaning that variances from planned performance would not be identified. OPM nonetheless deployed a limited version of the modernized system in February 2008. However, the system did not work as expected, and the agency suspended its operation and began restructuring the modernized program. In April 2009, we again reported on the initiative, noting that the agency still remained far from achieving the capabilities it had envisioned. Significant weaknesses continued to exist in the previously identified areas, and we noted additional weaknesses as well. Specifically, OPM lacked a plan describing how the program would proceed after terminating the earlier system's contract, and it lacked a fully functioning oversight body to monitor its modernization projects. 
To its credit, OPM agreed with all of our recommendations, and it did take some steps toward addressing them. Ultimately, however, it terminated the Retirement Modernization Program in February 2011. It has since stated that it does not plan to undertake another large-scale modernization effort. Instead, it plans to take targeted steps to improve retirement processing, such as hiring new staff and working to improve data quality. Even as it takes these more modest steps, however, it is essential that OPM fully address the deficiencies and institutionalize the management capabilities highlighted in our studies. Without doing so, the agency will not be effectively positioned to ensure the success of any future retirement or other system modernization projects that it pursues. This concludes the summary of my statement. I would look forward to your questions. Thank you, Ms. Melvin. Mr. Manzo, you are recognized for five minutes for an opening. Chairman Ross, Ranking Member Lynch, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to address the quality and indisputable value that companies like Monster bring to the online recruiting process. My name is Patrick Manzo. With me is my colleague, Mark Conway, Monster's Chief Information Officer. Our national unemployment rate is 9 percent. In certain regions and among veterans, that number is significantly higher. Putting unemployed Americans back to work is our number one national priority. To meet the challenge, we must create jobs and we must fill them with the right people. Even today, many jobs in both the public and private sectors go unfilled month after month. As you evaluate the Federal Government's hiring system and its capability, do so by comparison with the market. Best of breed services reside in the private sector where competitive pressures stimulate innovation and the cost of creating new technologies is spread over a broad customer base. This is certainly the case with our company. Over the last several years, we have invested hundreds of millions of dollars to bring to market significant new technology and streamline the hiring process. Most employers conduct the bulk of their recruiting activity online, leveraging the reach, tools, and efficiency that the Internet offers. Monster employs over 2,000 people in the United States. We pioneered the business of digital recruiting in 1994. And today, we are the only online recruitment provider able to serve customers on a truly global basis. Our flagship site serves millions of job seekers and tens of thousands of employers monthly with the most advanced set of tools in the industry. Every month, job seekers conduct more than 100 million job searches, view more than 70 million jobs, and post hundreds of thousands of resumes. An enterprise class online recruiting system, like Monsters, must have three key attributes, broad reach, precision search, and a robust infrastructure. I will speak to each. Reach is the ability to address and engage the right audience at the right time. Every month, the Monster brand reaches a significant portion of the U.S. Internet population and is shown billions of times across ours and our partner networks. That is no accident. We invest in search engine optimization and search engine marketing to extend our reach to key search engines where many job seekers begin their search. We have developed Apple iOS and Google Android mobile device applications. We have created technology that allows us to syndicate a job posting all over the web, thereby reaching passive candidates who may not be actively seeking a new position or visiting job boards. We have recently launched Be Known, our professional network on Facebook that allows users to connect with their professional contacts, grow their network, and discover new career opportunities. Reach is about achieving depth and breadth, volume and diversity. For employers, reach broadens the talent pool. For seekers, a greater volume and diversity of job postings provides an improved chance of finding that next great opportunity. Without competent search, however, this all adds up to a larger haystack. Search is the paramount virtue of any online job resource and is a necessary complement to reach. Most job search engines take an old school approach, searching based on keywords. They rely on the skill of the seeker to guess the right keywords. Even then, it is likely that thousands of job postings will contain those keywords and therefore be a match. To address these issues, we have invested over $100 million to launch our new semantic search engine. We have taught our search engine to understand the content and context of search queries. Rather than searching for keywords, semantic search understands the meaning or concepts behind the words and the context in which they appear. The benefit is more accurate, precise results, a better ability to find the right candidate or job, the needle, if you will, in the haystack. A modern job search infrastructure must be stable, secure, and interoperate with other technology. Today's job seekers expect site availability 24 hours a day, seven days a week. To provide this capability, Monster has three redundant data centers, allowing a stop rate at 99.999 percent uptime, or five nines availability. 
Security is a key focus for Monster in an area where we have made significant investments. The security of any system is a function of the measures in place to protect the data, not whether that data is located on a government computer system or a commercial computer system. No security solution is bulletproof, but we believe that our system of layered defenses, sophisticated technical measures, but also human analysts provides industry-leading security. Our customers use many different technologies to access our services. To accommodate this integration, we offer a robust set of tools that tens of thousands of customers use on a monthly basis to conduct millions of monthly transactions with Monster. To meet the challenges facing our country, our government must have the right tools to hire citizens with the right skills for government service. There is significant innovation underway in the marketplace. We must ensure that the federal government is leveraging the solutions that provide the best possible reach, search capability, and site infrastructure to acquire the best talent. Thank you, and I'd be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you, Mr. Manzo, and I'll recognize myself for five minutes of questions. Mr. Manzo, I'll go back to you. Um, you heard uh, Director Berry testify here earlier, and, and my concern was with the five-year contract that was existed between Monster and OPM prior to, to USA Jobs 3. And, and my biggest concern was flexibility. It appeared as though, according to Director Berry, that there was no flexibility to, to, to make modifications or to adapt to any changes. Is that your understanding? Uh, Mr. Chairman, that is not my understanding. I'd like to ask my colleague to speak to the details of that. Please, Mr. Conway. Yeah, so um, during the course of the contract, uh, we made uh, numerous enhancements to USA Jobs working in conjunction with OPM. One example of that is uh, we redesigned and relaunched the site in uh, January 2010, which is a, a new look and feel uh, and, and uh, simply new functionality for USA Jobs working in conjunction with OPM. And that, that was done as, an, as a renegotiation to the original contract? No, that work was part of the base contract. So there was no change in cost to OPM as a result of that? No. It was all part and parcel of the intended agreement? Correct. Okay. Uh, now, Mr. Manzo, do you all have a, um, a, a market research department? Uh, we do have a research uh, department. And they would, they would want to know what the end users are seeking and how best to perform the service that, that, that they are seeking? So we do, we do a lot of work in, the, in this regard. Uh, what I can tell you is that we do regular market surveys of our customers, both employers and job seekers. Uh, and that is important, isn't it? Well, that is how we know if we are doing a good job or not. Correct. And, and with regard to whether the resources that you are using are adequate, I would assume you have a research and development department as well. Uh, we have a product and technology division that, as I mentioned previously, we, we spend several hundred million dollars a year in, year in order to develop and bring to market new products to upgrade our site infrastructure. And you can handle over, uh, uh, how many did you say, 100 million uh, uh, applicants? Every, uh, every month uh, we will, we will, visit, uh, we will uh, host about 14 or 15 million unique visitors to our site. Those folks will conduct about 100 million searches. They will view about 70 million jobs, and they will post hundreds of thousands of resumes. These are, these are monthly averages. And would it be safe to say that, that, that Monster.com is the largest uh, human resource uh, applicant uh, search engine out there? Uh, we believe that uh, if you look at this from a global perspective, that, that we are the largest and most significant in the world. And in leading up to the change to USA Jobs 3, Monster was providing this service for OPM. Was there any problems at that time as to the service you were providing that you are aware of? Uh, if you are asking about uh, during, the, during the period, I mean, I think that uh, we overall provided a service that served the Federal Government's needs. Um, we are proud of the job we did. And, and, and to hit on this, because you raised it as one of your significant points, is security. And I think that, that the security issues that have been raised by members up here are that, well, you are you're, you're maybe uh, susceptible to hacking, whereas the Federal Government won't, which I, I think is, 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 is not necessarily correct. But I also understand that the security breaches that occurred with Monster were self-reported and self-corrected. Is, is that correct? Uh, well, Mr. Chairman, so I'm, I'm glad that you that you've raised the issue. Um, Chair, uh, Director Berry is correct that those matters are matters of public record. Um, they are matters of public record in large part because we did a lot to put them into the public eye. Um, in each of those cases, we proactively reached out to federal government agencies. In this case, the Federal Trade Commission. We also spoke to law enforcement agencies. We spoke to relevant state attorneys generals, and we also spoke. Uh, proactively to our customers because we felt that that was important and part of our obligation. I think that security is important and I, and I think that we need to think about it and keep it uh, in the proper context. Just because data is on a government computer system does not mean it is safer than on a commercial computer system. And I think that there have been lots of public breaches of government computer systems that underscore that point. What makes data safe or unsafe are the measures that are put in place to protect that. 
We believe that a layered defense system is critical, and that involves both IT security steps, things like encryption, things like making sure you're using secure coding and development practices. So your we, security has taken in, um, great steps since these, these initial breaches. Chairman Ross, I think that we've, we've, we've learned from our mistakes, and I think that uh, those events, however painful, have helped us to become better and understand more about the environment, and it's something that we invest in significantly, and I think that we advance our skills in this area on a regular basis. Thank you. One last question to you. Um, do you believe that Monster.com can provide the service that is being demanded and expected by those applying for the Federal Government employment uh, better than and within budget of OPM's current USA Jobs 3? We do believe that. Thank you. Um, Ms. Melvin, with regard to the retirement system, uh, what steps are, should, should, should OPM take at this point? I mean, they, they've discontinued their $100 million failure. Um, three and a half claims per day is absolutely, you know, unacceptable. Do you have any recommendations that, that, that they need to take initially to try to automate this and reach a point where they can get caught up and not have to worry about being so backlogged uh, and inefficient? Well, first of all, I'd start by saying that I think it was a, uh, it actually a good step for OPM to step away from the modernization effort that it was undertaking. After 20 plus years, it obviously was not working, and it obviously uh, indicated that there are underlying uh, deficiencies in the approach that they were taking. Our biggest concern has been that, I, that OPM lacks an overall uh, management structure, if you will, IT management capability in terms of the fundamental uh, tools or mechanisms for really planning and managing. Uh, in the first panel, one of the points of discussion was about the need for OPM to uh, develop a plan for moving forward. I think that that is a critical step uh, that they have to take. But in saying that they have to uh, develop a plan, I think it is important that they also look at the mistakes of the past efforts that they have had. Um, it is it's important to really be able to draw from those experiences, incorporate that into whatever planning that they undertake. Uh, and it is not just about planning the system itself and the different components that go into it. It is about understanding what their overall needs are. And a large part of that is in terms of the IT uh, capability they have from a human capital standpoint to really uh, not only lead, uh, but to undertake uh, that type of initiative going forward. Thank you. I see my time is up. I will now um, recognize the gentleman from Massachusetts, Ranking Member Mr. Lynch. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I want to welcome Mr. Manzo. I understand he's a, a constituent of mine in Walpole. Uh, we're doing redistricting right now, but at, <laughs> at, at one o'clock, Walpole will be back in my district. So, uh, well, I'm, I'm pleased to hear that. That might not be a good thing from your standpoint, uh, you know, based on my my concern around uh, uh, these contracts. But uh, I, I certainly appreciate uh, you being here and, and all of our witnesses here. Uh, Here's, here's the deal, though. I have information and data on the Federal Employee Retirement System uh, and, and the problems with the, the, the network uh, with regard to that program. The USA Jobs uh, website has been live for 30 days, and my Inspector General, and Ms. Melvin, and, and Mr. McFarland have not had a chance to review that. Um, I just want to, in a, in a sort of uh, equal opportunity criticism, uh, that program has been messed up since, uh, well, I think, Ms. Melvin, you said this is a 20-year effort, so that would have gone back to the first George Bush uh, administration, right through Clinton, right through George W. Bush, and continuing today uh, with President Obama. So there is equal opportunity for criticism that, that that Federal Employee Retirement System has not worked properly. So this is not a partisan criticism of uh, Mr. Berry, who appeared earlier. Um, but, Mr. McFarland, I, I, I read with great interest your, uh, your testimony today. And uh, I know that you have uh, offered, let, I just want to talk about these folks that are deceased for 20, 30 years and are still getting uh, annuity checks, uh, their, their, their loved ones are. And uh, as, as Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman has uh, pointed out, uh, at, at times this is about $120 million a year, but many of those are late, late notices. A person will pass away and there will still be a few checks sent out. But it might take 60 or 90 days for a person to notify uh, the retirement system that there has been a, uh, a death in the family. 
most of that gets back, but you still have a, a, a fairly significant number of people that are forging signatures for, for decades. And uh, you, you filed a report, and I, I think it has a lot of great points, and I want to ask you about some of those points. Um, to, stop, to stop these people uh, from committing a fraud against the retirement system by collecting the checks of their deceased loved ones, uh, you, you recommended uh, computer matching with Social Security death master file. So if they are not getting their Social Security uh, and, and we know they are deceased, we ought to be able to cross-reference that with uh, what the federal, and federal Employee Retirement System. How is that working out right now? Excuse me. Right now, the uh, process is ongoing. It has been for quite a while as far as weekly uh, batch checks. Can, can I get a report? Can the Chairman and I get a report on how we are doing on that? Because I want to know how, sure. many, how many folks we, we uncover by this cross-matching process with Social Security's death file. Sure we can. Okay. Yes. Next, and I, and I got a few questions, so we need to move on. Uh, you also recommend increasing contact, which is, I guess you do a random uh, uh, contact process with the number of uh, recipients to try to elicit responses to find out, you know, who's, who's alive and who's not, and, you know, who's, who's legally receiving checks and who's not. How, how is that process going? Well, we recommended uh, the over 90 process and the over 100 process. And uh, there was these are these are uh, recipients who are over ninety or over hundred. Yes, that's yeah. correct, and that uh, that paid uh, good dividends for for okay. us. Likely it, suspects, I guess. Pardon me. They're likely suspects <laughs> yes. over over ninety, over hundred. Well, Although, you know, I get the, it. All right, go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, the determination, of course, is to see if they're uh, still living, and uh, that. That way we can, you know, uh, get right to the heart of the matter. Yeah. Can I get a report on that? Can Mr. Chairman get a report on that as well? Absolutely. That seems like something that might bear fruit. Sure. Um, if I can continue, you also recommended an analysis of undeliverable correspondence. So you mail something out and it comes back. Yes. Uh, 1099, is that what you're doing? 1099 R is yes. Yeah. And when they come back, well, right now there's a there is a, a backlog of 33,000 that have been returned. Wow. And the process to go through that is, uh, well, it is just not being attained. Yeah. Is there any way we could use some resources from the post office to, to sort of confirm that? Or, or is there anybody else? 33,000, that is a lot to go through. Well, it is a lot to go through, but I, I don't know that uh, the post office is the answer in this yeah. particular case. I think the Clearly, the problem lies with the, with the process in OPM. Do we suspend, once we don't get a response, once the mail comes back, uh, do we, we don't suspend, though. We just keep paying them, right? Well, no. There are some times that they, they are suspended if, if we have enough information. Okay. But the first time back, if, if we receive a letter that, you know, that comes back uh, for that reason, all right. Then, then uh, we just, you know, it, it's, right. it's in a in a stockpile of thirty three thousand. Right yeah. Now. Okay. Well, maybe we got to expedite the process for cutting those folks off. The last, uh, the last uh, recommendation that you made, and I'm just about well, I'm almost out of time here, uh, is uh, cross checking with these financial institutions where some of these checks are being deposited. Yes. Uh, How is that going? Are there any roadblocks or obstruction to getting that money back or, or uncovering fraud? Well, there is no particular roadblock to getting it back, but uh, it, it, let, me, can I, let me just explain something that I sure. think might, might give a, a very good picture. Uh, what happens is that this last report that we did, it was it was intended to. This was 2011. Yes, okay. yes. It was it really intended to manage expectations, and by that I mean, it was our way of telling the director that it's time to stop the piecemeal uh, approach at this, and to to obtain the, the proper amount of funding and uh, subject matter experts 
put them in their own office and let them do this job. Yeah. Because what has happened for years is that there will be an effort on the uh, program's part to, to find this money, but it, is, it lacks so much because their inference or their, their uh, impetus is to get the check out, which is fine. That's, that's a big part of the job. Yeah. But there is very, very little inclination to work busily to, to uh, recover the funds. So it has to be, it has to be a, a, a new program area that is dedicated to that. That has come, come to us after just so many attempts to, to piecemeal this thing together, and it just okay. isn't working this way. All right. Mr. McFarland, thank you very much for your hard work and your testimony, and I appreciate the indulgence of the Chair. Thank you. No problem. Uh, now recognize the gentleman from Michigan, home of the Detroit Tigers, Mr. Wahlberg. And I must admit the Lions, uh, even with the last couple of games. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, following up on the, the last few statements of Director Berry, I would just like to ask uh, uh, comments from uh, Mr. McFarland as well as uh, Ms. Melvin. Uh, Director Berry stated that all metrics are moving in the right direction for USA Jobs 3.0. Do you agree, Mr. McFarland? Well, we, we haven't had time to review the implementation. But what we are, what we are planning to do, you know, we are going to do penetration testing. That is an audit group that we are bringing in, a specialized group to do this. And then, and then we are going to do systems development life cycle review by ourselves. So, so once we do that, we can answer your question, but right now I can't. Ms. Melvin, are the metrics going the right direction? We, too, have not looked at USA jobs. Uh, I, w I would say, however, that uh, metrics are extremely important, and it will be critical that there be metrics such as uh, Mr. McFarlane has indicated in place, but I couldn't tell you at this point uh, how effective the ones that they have are. I can say, however, that it would be extremely important for them to articulate specific metrics and be able to report on the success of those metrics. Okay. Mr. Manzo, any comments on that from your professional position there? Mr. Wahlberg, uh, I, I'm not in a position to assess or, or verify any metrics that OPM may have related to the performance of USA Jobs, so unfortunately okay. I can't comment. Let me, uh, let me ask you then, uh, Mr. Manzo uh, or Conway, uh, either one, in your professional opinions, what should uh, ideal private-public uh, partnerships look like relating to the Federal Government to IT? Well, I'll, 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 take a, I'll take a stab at that, Mr. Wahlberg. You know, I think that it's clear that best-of-breed services reside in many cases, particularly in technical areas, in the private marketplace. And that's because there is significant commercial competition. Um, there is much broader customer bases over which to spread the cost of developing these new technologies. What the government needs to do is they need to go and they need to figure out what is the best technology and how do we apply this technology to get the best results for the lowest cost. Now, Director Berry has made the point that there are certain things that are inherently governmental. Um, we don't think that hosting the federal government's hiring system falls into that category. Um, we think that the private sector is eminently well suited um, to do this job and to do this job uh, cost effectively, efficiently, and to provide significant continuing value going forward. Uh, in terms of developing one of these systems and in terms of looking at the cost, we need to look not only at the cost to set it up and the cost to run it, but we need to look at the continuing research and development cost to make sure that that system keeps pace with development and new technologies as they are available. And that is where the private sector comes in best? That, that would be our belief, yes. Uh, Ms. Ms. Melvin, uh, you stated in your testimony that uh, OPM agreed with your recommendations on the retirement system yet they did not implement those recommendations. Why didn't they? We actually had about 19 recommendations, and um, they were specific to the retirement system modernization. And in fact, they began to take actions. They agreed with all of those recommendations, and they did begin to take, begin to take some steps toward addressing them. Uh, for example, uh, in the 2005 timeframe for our study, uh, we had noted some concerns with, for example, security planning and requirements. When we came back in 2008, we saw that they had taken some actions, uh, and that is one example 
example. However, um, the bigger concern uh, that we have is that the types of recommendations that we made, while they were driven by our work looking at the retirement system's modernization, are actually um, recommendations that apply more broadly. I mentioned in my previous statement uh, that it is it, important that they have underlying uh, IT management capabilities uh, and controls in place. And uh, across the 19 or so recommendations that we have made, uh, they constitute fundamental aspects of having strong IT management. What we did not see was the capability of the agency to move in the direction of actually getting a robust and institutionalized management capability in place that would incorporate the various aspects of IT management that we noted. But again, any reason why they didn't move fully in the direction that you uh, you recommended? That, that would actually be a question that is probably better posed to OPM. But what I can say from our work was that we saw them trying. We did not see, however, uh, necessarily the capability there uh, in terms of their really uh, having a strong understanding, perhaps, of what were some of the, the uh, deficiencies, uh, the, the implications or the significance of the deficiencies that we noted. So I would assume that, that, cap that capability still isn't there. We haven't been in since uh, 2009 to look at it, but across our follow-up work, um, we, we've seen that they have attempted to make some changes. Uh, for example, when we were doing our work in the 2008 timeframe and, and before, uh, the, the Chief Information Officer was not a part of the overall efforts that were being made to put the retirement systems modernization in place. We saw that individual standing on the outside, so to speak, of the process that was being undertaken. Uh, when we were there in 2009, however, the CIO, uh, the, the, the current CIO, was a more active player. We did see them taking some steps to uh, put in place, for example, or, or to have their oversight body, I should say, more actively involved. Uh, but I would be cautious uh, because we have not looked and, and I would not want to imply that they have a full capability at this point to move forward uh, based on our price, past work. Thank you. I see my time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Wahlberg. Now I recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, as a result of budget cuts, many agencies have announced plans to offer early retirement and buyouts to employees, including the Postal Service, NASA, Internal Revenue Service, Government Accountability Office, and the Department of Defense and its subcomponents such as the Army and the Air Force. Uh, Mr. Tamburina, could you tell us how many positions has the Department of Defense offered for early outs and buyouts, and how many more early retirement and buyouts does the Department of Defense anticipate offering in the next year? Uh, Mr. Congressman, thank you for that question. I will have to get back to you with the exact numbers. All the components have the authority to offer VSIP VERA right now. We can uh, provide for the record what the actual take rate is to date um, for fiscal 2011 and what is planned for 2012. Most of our uh, uniform services are trying to place people as opposed to uh, do any more draconian action and offer them visa vera as an alternative. But we will give you the specific numbers. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. McFarlane and Ms. Melvin, given what we know, what impact do you think the early outs and buyouts would have on OPM's ability to reduce the retirement claims backlog? Based on what I heard today, uh, I would say that any future increases in the retirement backlog would only stand to um, continue to make their effort much more difficult uh, in terms of, 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 of processing the claims that they have. Um, I agree with that, sir. And then let me ask, um, would you think that OPM might need additional resources to handle the, the workload? to clear these up? My work has not looked at their um, programmatic, if you will, IT, uh, excuse me, programmatic human capital resources. Uh, it is focused only on the information technology aspects of what they have done. So I don't have information to really uh, provide a response that I think would be credible. Thank you. Um, 
Mr. Tamburino, let me ask you, do you think that the agencies themselves should pay for the, the, the activity to clear these up, or might there be some other way to, to get the resources? Mr. Congressman, thanks for the question. We share the concern for the delay in processing retirement. I have suggested to Director Barry um, some alternatives for how to do this. I look forward to talking with them, him about that more. As far as a fee for service that is not a cost sharing agreement that is foreign to the Department of Defense, if it was supported by a customer service agreement as to what we could expect. Uh, and a level of performance that we could expect, I think the Department would engage in that conversation. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. McFarland, uh, in, in sort of seeing this issue unfold, from your point of view, um, well, let me just say, <laughs> Some might be struck by the fact that the incoming administration in 2009 maybe made a decision more on, if you will, theological grounds, insourcing is good, than on, yes, but when we weigh cost benefits, uh, we might come to a different conclusion. Is it fair to say that sort of there was a, an a priori conviction of the administration coming into office that uh, insourcing is, has, has a certain preference associated with it, from your point of view? Well, from my point of view, it would, would simply be from news and newspapers. And uh, the, the prior administration obviously wanted to outsource, and it appears as, this, as if this administration wants to insource. So that is the best I can answer that. Would you do you have a point of view as the IG that one is better than the other? No, sir, I do not. Would it be fair to say it is actually a false proposition that one is better than the other? We have to look at the merits? Well, I, I think definitely we, we should look at the merits. Were there problems with the previous contract with Monster that led the, uh, the uh, Office of Personnel Management to reevaluate uh, the outsourcing of this contract? Well, not that I am aware of. Uh, as far as the uh, as far as the uh, USA jobs, Mr. Menzo or Mr. Conway, were there problems hmm? that you addressed? But were there problems that were cited by OPM when they made the decision to bring the contract inside? Um, I'm not aware of any problems cited by OPM when the decision was made to bring it inside. Will the gentleman yield. Yes. Uh, wasn't there a case where we had a security breach of 1.6 million people, their information uh, being hacked, including uh, about a half a million Federal employees? I, I, and if I can add, reclaiming my time, Mr. Manzo, before you answer, that is sort of what I was getting at. I, and, and was that not sort of a corruption of data in the sense that uh, it was a mingling of this Federal employee file with something else? Uh, so I would be pleased to answer that question. So, Congressman Lynch, first to respond to your question. Uh, yes, as, as you have noted, there was and is a matter of public record that um, there were security incidents in 2007 and 2009. Those did. And in fairness, I, I want to say that your company did come forward, did try to correct it, did notify the consumer. I will did, remind did the gentleman he is on my time. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Mayor. <I> yield back. <laughs> May Mr. Continue? Manzo, you may certainly continue. Uh, so, uh, yes, th those those events did happen, and I, you know, I'd be happy to go into excruciating detail with you about why that occurred, how that occurred, well, and what, we, you what do, we learned from that. Okay. Before you do, Mr. Conway, you just testified to me that you weren't aware of any problems. So, uh, to be specific, um, with regards to execution of the project, um, delivering functionality, delivering on the day-to-day -day operations of the site, I was not aware of any issues. I was not in reference to. Uh, previous data security incidents, as we stated, those were public record, and we were very uh, clear in terms of um, uh, being forthcoming with those incidents. And Mr. Connolly, I'd also add that I don't think we were given any reason when the, when uh, OPM announced that they were going to. That's what I was going to get at, Mr. Manzo. Right. right. It was it was essentially a black box decision. Okay. So us. they didn't cite those past incidents as this is reason for concern. They did not, to my knowledge. No. Mr. Mr. Connolly, may, may I add something? Uh, I assumed that your question was, was 
was there a particular problem that, that influenced uh, this administration? Yes, were there before? performance issues? Well, other than what has been mentioned, just the two, you know, breaches that took place with, uh, with Monster, 2007, 2008, uh, the first one, there, the breach is 146,000 resumes were, were uh, compromised. But uh, by the same token, I don't think any uh, Social Security numbers were in either 2007 or 2008. But my point is, I don't know what bearing that had on the decision. Mr. McFarland, um, uh, let me ask qualitatively, what, in your professional judgment, what is the difference between uh, this site when it was managed by the private sector and this site now that it is managed in the public sector? Is there a qualitative difference that you have observed? Well, certainly not at this point. I, in a couple of weeks, I haven't observed no. And I, and I, I don't know that I would uh, be qualified to answer that if I, if I did study it. Mr. Uh, if the Chairman would just indulge one more. Uh, Mr. Okay. Manzo and Mr. Conway, um, have you been asked or have you offered any technical advice in the transition from you monster managing it to OPM managing it? Uh, yes, uh, Congressman Connolly. I know that our Chief Executive Officer has spoken to Director Berry on numerous occasions and has made clear to him that we will offer any technical assistance necessary in order to make USA Jobs 3.0 stand up and that transition be successful. I thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman, I just end by saying I, I, what always bothers me about the subject of insourcing and outsourcing is that uh, uh, there are, uh, there are uh, advocates on both sides who make this more uh, a matter of theology, that one is inherently better normatively than the other. Uh, and I think that is, A, a false premise, and B, a very dubious course for the Federal Government to follow. We ought to look at the merits of the case in front of us and make an informed and pragmatic decision, irrespective of our theological blinders. With that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Connolly. And that should conclude our uh, panel uh, today. I thank every, all the panelists for being here today. Uh, with nothing else uh, further, this uh, subcommittee stands adjourned. Which is fine. Yeah, which is, which is most of ours.